I got some good answers here. But before we, uh, we look at these, uh, these descriptions of how you believe God sees you, let's talk a little bit about how you might see yourself. Because sometimes um, we see our, how we see ourselves is very much shaped by the world or by how we were raised or by how we want others to see us. And so sometimes maybe in theological terms, if you talk about that, we see ourselves as perhaps unworthy, or perhaps as too proud, or perhaps we see ourselves as perfect or, or poor or sinful, and, and those are things we have taught how we see ourselves unworthy. Or maybe we see ourselves as we as others might see us or as we like other might like others to see us as successful as um, as or as frazzled or we see ourselves uh, by what we do there are several um, descriptions of by what we do in our cars we got we are moms we are leaders we are business people we are retired we are these things or, or we are who our relatives are I am Allison's mom uh, how do we see ourselves is defined by how others see us how we want to portray ourselves and how the world shapes us but how does God see us? Well, let's see if some things here. I'm going to just read some of these and, and see if, and then you can just judge to yourself if this is how, how, how God sees you or how God sees us, or maybe it's somebody's perception of, of themselves. God uh, challenged, troubled but working hard, confused, old, maybe God's seeing me as old every day, uh, as a mother, a lot of moms here, open-minded, a catalyst, a listener, a follower, worthy, hard worker, lots of works in progress here, uh, unfinished symphony, sincere, a beacon, willing, able, helpful, uh, God sees me as I am, caring, compassion, strength, God sees me as strength, willing, humbled, co-creator, and then I have several here, God sees me as his child, his daughter, his son. How does God see you and do you see yourself as God sees you? The scripture from almost beginning to the end has many words that describe how God sees you um, or how, and how God sees us. And, and we could spend the time just going through scripture that kind of uplifts that. But I want to talk about a few other words that weren't mentioned as your list, but, but these are key words, key themes that outline how God sees us. God sees us as blessed as loved, as gifted. The, uh, the letter to the Ephesians and Paul's other letters talks about we are all gifted differently, uniquely. We are cherished. We are acceptable. God sees us as forgiven, as beautiful, as talented managers, as generous, as those who are able to, to invest and make good things come out of things. God sees us as beautiful, as grace-filled. God sees us, quite frankly, as this vessel of hope, this conduit of love, this bringer of justice, this reconciler in the world, God sees us, God sees you in that way. Somebody who's willing to take risk for the sake of God's kingdom. Now, do you see yourself that way? Do you see yourself that way? I'm not, I'm kind of wondering because I don't see a lot of people going, yeah. That's who I am. I'm blessed, I'm redeemed, I'm gifted, I'm loved. I don't see that a lot of times coming through faces or actions, and I wonder why. You know, there are plenty of, uh, I, and the scripture doesn't tell you you are these things just to help build your self-esteem. That's not the purpose of this. You can go to Barnes & Noble or, or Amazon and find all kinds of books that help you claim your self-esteem. But what the scripture does is remind us, remind you that you are a chip off the old block. All these things, blessed, loving, gifted, valued, are part of God's DNA. 
part of, and so you are filled with this DNA, with this chip of potential that gives you, that makes you gifted beyond your understanding, that offers potential and possibility beyond measure. You see, God sees you in the same way that a new parent see, Holt sees their baby for the very first time as perfect as full of potential, as not something who's just is, is helpless, but five fingers, five toes, ten if you count both of them, as the future and as the present. God sees you as a sculptor sees this stone and sees this beautiful sculpture inside of it. God sees you as a jeweler sees a rough cut diamond and can see that diamond right inside. God sees you in all your potential, not just a work in progress, but you at the end. That's how God sees you. Valued. So why don't we see ourselves that way. Why don't we, and if we do see ourselves that way, why don't we act like we see ourselves that way? Why don't we reflect our lives in, in majesty and beauty and confidence? Why don't, we, why don't we reflect our lives in a way that brings awe and praise? Why don't we? Well, I think there's a reason for that. The reason that we oftentimes or can't seem to, to live as God sees us is because of fear. Fear is a one of the major things that keeps us from showing our true DNA. Fear is the one thing that keeps us from fully seeing us as God sees us, as given, as God gifted, as God, as God valued. Fear. You see, on the one hand, we know in our heads that we are richly blessed by our maker, yet fear tells us that we might not have enough for the future, and so we hold on to what we've got out of fear. On one hand, we know that God accepts us for who we are, but fear of what others think about us make us present ourselves as one who is not. On the one hand, we are people who spout the belief that with God all things are possible, but fear of failure keeps us from reaching out, from risking for what really is possible. Fear is powerful. Fear is paralyzing. Fear is that major barrier that sees us from that keeps us from seeing ourselves as God sees us and from acting as God calls us. Seeing ourselves as God-gifted, God-blessed, God-rich selves. Why? And here's why it's so hard to see ourselves that way. You see, if we, if we will begin to see ourselves as, as rich, then we would have to find ways to use our wealth following as part of that chip off the block. If we begin to see ourselves as gifted, uniquely gifted, then we will have to use our gifts for God's purpose. If we begin to see ourselves as capable and filled with potential, then we're going to have to use our capabilities and our potential to help build up God's realm in this world. If we see ourselves as acceptable, that means we're going to have to accept the other ones who are also acceptable. If we see ourselves as God sees us, it means we're going to have to act like we have God DNA in us. We're going to have to act like a chip off that block, and that is scary, folks. That's overwhelming because God is so awesome, so amazing, so powerful, so complete, so gifted. How can we possibly be see ourselves as God sees us? We're more like that manager in the parable that, that is following the first few verses we read. We, more, we, we know that God has given us something, but we're afraid to do something with it, and so we bury it. Fear causes us to bury who we are, our true selves, and with when we bury that, we bury any chance for joy and fullness of life. You see, fear causes us to withdraw and turn in on ourselves. Fear causes us to make our lives smaller and, and more manageable and not so out of control with so many things that we have to take risks for. 
Fear causes us to close off those, what scripture says, the eyes of our heart. Because we just can't handle seeing ourselves in such full, bright, living, active, action, color. We just can't deal with it. That's what fear does to you. It makes your world and makes all the possibilities in the world so much smaller. In short, fear, quite literally, makes us ill. Most of us know who Dorothy is. Dorothy, who, who we see on the streets, oftentimes on cold winter night, pushing her grocery cart. How many of you know who Dorothy is? Dorothy holding on to her stuff. Dorothy trying to manage her life on her own, afraid to trust, afraid to talk, paralyzed by paranoia, which is fear taken to its utmost extreme. The sad thing is, Dorothy has family. We receive a call every so often from her niece, who's wondering if we've seen Dorothy and if she's okay. We receive a cards from her relatives with, with money tucked in and say, next time you see Dorothy, can you give her this card? Dorothy has a community here. You all know about Dorothy and care about Dorothy and want the best for Dorothy. Dorothy is loved, but she doesn't see it. And so she remains huddled, alone, simply surviving. And you know, in the same way, we may be more like our friend Dorothy than perhaps we like to admit. Now, we don't have a psychiatric condition that limits us like the paranoia limits Dorothy. We don't have an ish identity issue like schizophrenia that calls us, that helps us, that makes us see the world in a skewed way. But we do live in fear because that somebody might find out that we've been faking our identity. We live in fear that holds us back, that keeps us guarded. We live in fear that makes us see the world smaller and scarce and not as filled with abundance of possibility. We live with a fear that keeps us turned inward from knowing and claiming who we are and whose we are as a beloved child of God, valued, cherished, precious. We live with the fear that keeps us from seeing ourselves as connected with a larger community, this God web of tapestry and resources. We live with the fear that keeps us from reaching out. And you know what? The only antidote I know for fear, the kind of spiritual fear that paralyzes, is something called faith or trust. Faith in the Creator who says it is good. Faith in the world and the possibilities that is within it. Faith in ourselves and our own God-given giftedness. Faith in the generosity and giftedness of others. Faith that God is indeed good. Faith is the antidote to fear, to worry, to anxiety, to hopelessness. It's the only one I know. Faith is living as if God is in charge because God is, and with God, all things are possible. Now, I did a little bit of a, of a scripture research, and I, and I googled uh, in, in one of the concordances a phrase, do not be afraid. Or, and I googled, do not be afraid, do not fear, and have no fear. And that phrase pops up 139 times throughout scripture. It's a theme, don't be afraid. There's a reason it says that, don't be afraid because fear paralyzes. And then I googled another phrase, I googled phrases, uh, trust in the Lord, trust in God, and trust God. Now, the phrases about fear come to, about 130, come to 139 times in the New Revised Standard Version. The phrases about trusting come up to 139 times antidote, fear, and trust. I couldn't believe it when I saw it, but it, it is true. 
You know, fear says, there is nobody I can count on but me and I need to take care of myself. And faith says, I am never alone because I can count on God. Fear says, there is not enough to go around, so I'll grab my share while I can and maybe a little bit more. Faith says, you can have my share too because I trust there will be more, and there will. Fear says, I can't. Faith says, I can with God's help. Fear says, no flat out no to possibilities and faith says with God all things are possible. This past week um, Scott Carpenter died, you might have read that in the Herald Times, uh, the second American astronaut in, to orbit the earth and the Herald Times quoted him as saying this about fear. He says, conquering fear is one of life's greatest pleasures. And it could be done in a lot of different places. Conquering fear is one of life's greatest pleasures. It can be done in a lot of different, different places. And you know what? I think the Apostle Paul would agree. Because you see, he talks a lot about conquering fear that imprisons. And he says to himself, I'm not imprisoned by fear anymore or hatred of someone else. I'm imprisoned by the Lord, the, the passage says. Paul was one whose faith freed him from fear so he can say, could say, I am more than a conqueror. I am in Christ who loves me, period, and nothing can separate me from that love. In this letter to the Ephesians, um, which reflects Paul's thoughts and faith, we hear a prayer that is offered. It's a very powerful prayer, but it's a prayer that kind of surprised me as I read it. It's in chapter 1, and let me read it for a little bit. I'm going to read it. It's from, I'm reading it from the message, and it says this. It says, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be opened so you can see exactly what God is calling you to do to grasp the immensity of this glorious way of life he has for you. Oh, the utter extravagance of his work in those who trust him. Endless energy, boundless strength. Now did you notice what this prayer is not about? This prayer does not pray to God, bring power, bring me strength, bring me energy. It doesn't say any of that stuff. It doesn't say bring me any of that stuff. What it says is that it is a prayer for God, for the eyes of our hearts to open up and see the energy and strength and power that is already present. It's not a prayer for, for, to, for us to be strong. It's a prayer for us to see that we are strong. It's not a prayer for, for power, but it's a prayer for us to see and claim the power that is ours. That's what this prayer is about. And his, God, this prayer is for us. Open the eyes of our heart, Lord, and let us see ourselves as you see us, as people of hope, as people of abundance, as people of generosity, as people who find pleasure in taking risks and giving and loving for the sake of the world that God loves. You know, we could talk about the possibilities in our own lives when we let go of fear and begin to have faith and trust. And we can also do the same thing for us as a congregation. We can look at each other. We can look at this building that's been here for almost a hundred years through the eyes of fear. And if we look at this place through the eyes of fear, we're going to see and be overwhelmed by falling plaster, by an air conditioner that broke down. We're going to be overwhelmed, fear is going to overwhelm us when we see pews that are half empty. When we see and our eyes see a money pit, fear that our budget isn't going to be met, that's how eyes of fear see today. But what would happen 
If we look at this place with eyes of faith, with hearts, with our eyes of our heart open to what God is and who God is. What if we open our hearts and see this place as God sees it, as a sanctuary of oasis filled with hope, a sacred home for God's hurting people, a place of majesty and praise and song and worship, a place of grounding, a place not half empty but half full and waiting for generations to come and fill it, a legacy that is that we can build on for the future. That's how we can see this place through eyes of faith. And that gives us joy and pleasure and excitement. You know, we do have a choice. We can choose to fear and live that way or we can choose to live in trust. The scriptures are clear. God is here. And with God, all things are possible. May God bless you, children of God, with possibilities that reflect God's DNA in you. Amen.